moving mic, so he might not stay put. Good morning, everybody. Let's go ahead and get started. Good morning again. Welcome to our next general session. Uh, we're pleased to have uh, Governor of Colorado with us this morning, Governor John Hickenlooper. Uh, he needs, yeah, let's give him a shout out. He's been one of our keynote speakers for just about eight years. It's really, every winter conference, I think you've made them all. And so we're really grateful to have you here. So uh, he needs very little introduction for most of us, but for those of you who don't know or just kind of like to know, um, so our governor is the former two-term mayor of Denver. And I'm going to have a little fun with him here in a few minutes. Right? He's like, uh-oh. <laughs> um, but he's the former two-term mayor of Denver and one of the top five big city mayors in the nation, according to Time Magazine. He opened Colorado's first brew pub. Uh, you know, well, I'll drink to that, but I'm going to come back to that one. Uh, he's like, I know where this is going. Uh, he ran for Colorado governor on a jobs creation and economic development platform, and he stayed true to his mission. His peers elected him chairman of the Western Governors Association in 2014, 2015. And while we don't see eye to eye, uh, he's always been open to hearing from county government, county leaders, and sensitive to county concerns. Uh, I said I was going to have a little fun with him, but on a personal note, um, uh, some of you know my dad passed away earlier this year. Well, he and Governor Hickenlooper had known each other in a couple different venues, and uh, they both had restaurants. It was, uh, which was it Wine Coop? It was Wine Coop Brewing that you had, and my dad had Coyotes at the time, and so they were in business together, and they got to know each other, and so I remember my first conversation with our, at the time, candidate governor was with my dad, and then they got to know each other in Denver politics, and when my dad passed away, the governor's office sent a really nice letter that we were at the memorial service, so just on a personal note, I want to say thank you. I really appreciate that. So please join me in giving our attention and a warm CCI welcome to Governor John Hickenlooper. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, What's that? The cartoon character says, I'm not worthy, I'm not worthy. As most of you know, I'm not worthy. Um, thanks for the introduction, Lou. And I think it's, it is worth pointing out, uh, he mentioned that it always seems dis, like a dislocation. I was two-term mayor of Denver and now two-term governor. Again, I was the first mayor of Denver to get elected governor in 140 years. And uh, many of you know that a, a reflects generations of of conflict and, uh, you know, just a, a, a lack of understanding between Denver and Denver suburbs, as well as uh, the metro area and the rural parts of the state. And I know that um, that, that bridge continues to this day. But one of the, what I want to talk about today, and I'm going to try and keep this to the, uh, Chip Taylor, where did Chip go? Well, I forgot to give him a shout. You should give Chip and the board a, a big round of applause as well. Anyway, uh, one of the things I'm going to do is try and keep this. To, he said, go ahead and talk for 30 minutes. I think 30 minutes is a little too long. I suspect many of you have questions that will be more <laughs> provocative to the room. Uh, and so therefore, I will uh, try and keep this short. But I really want to talk about some of those, uh, our efforts to bi bridge some of those divides and really to begin to find ways to stimulate the economy, not just right along the front range, but in every part of the state. And I'm not saying we've solved any problems, but I think we've made some headway in talking about it. And when I was chair of the Western Governors Association, one of the things we talked about was how to create more economic equity across states that have rural and urban areas. And when I was head of the National Governors Association, which I did in 2015 or 13 and 14, uh, had the same situation where we looked, looked at what does that equity look like. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt said, and this is a great quote, he said, the one characteristic more essential than any other is foresight. Uh, and it should be the growing nation with a, with a future that is the one that takes the long look ahead. And that's really what, what we've been doing for the last year and a half or so to try and 
look at the landscape that, that we have now, but also try to imagine what it's going to look like in 10 years, in 20 years, and in 50 years. Uh, and a big part of that has been trying to uh, assess the challenges of, of that kind of economic equity that is our goal. And Irv Halter is out here somewhere. Where is General Halter is our head of the Department of Local Affairs, and he's spent a lot of time looking at how, how do we increase communication, and rather than people in Denver trying to figure out what is a, a, a better, stronger way to stimulate economies in the rural parts of the state, what are the ideas that come out of the, the rural parts? And that's how we started. When I first got elected, we did the bottom-up economic development process. You know, when I was running in, uh, in uh, 2010, we were about, I think we were 40th in job creation. We had come out of that recession, uh, we're just beginning to come out of that recession, and we were way behind most other states. And in that bottom-up economic development plan where we went to every county, and many people in this room were part of that process, uh, maybe not as county commissioners, but in those hearings that we heard. And it was interesting. We came away with six basic core, uh, core values that we thought would help drive the economy all over the state. We wanted to make sure that, uh, that the state was pro-business. We heard that in every single county across the state. We heard that we want less red tape and bureaucracy. And so we've gone now, we finished about seven months ago, six months ago, we've gone through all, and this is a, a, a mammoth undertaking, we went through all 23,500 rules and regulations in every agency that regulates businesses in Colorado and we either, uh, either eliminated or dramatically simplified almost half, 11, 000, I think it was 11,300 of those rules and regulations. And, and you can feel, you talk to small business people, many of them can feel that there's been, uh, especially people that have started businesses, that, that it's been an easier task than it was. Uh, the bottom-up economic development plan talked a lot about making sure we had better access to capital. And at that time in, two th in 2010, we were really one of the last states in terms of investment of equity into new businesses. Uh, we're now in, I think, the top five. Uh, a lot of that is just the success of our entrepreneurs uh, that have attracted that capital, but we also have a number of programs, that, some of them through DOLA, uh, some of them through the Office of Economic Development and International Trade, but they're trying to find ways to get that key amount of, and sometimes it's literally a $50,000 or $100,000 to a small business that's trying to, what they call a proof of concept, trying to demonstrate to other investors that their idea ha has economic viability that will really work. Uh, we also found when we went bottom up that we needed to focus on innovation and technology. And that technology is, again, not just for the urban areas. Uh, many of you know Dr. Ajay Menon, who for almost 12 years was the head of the business school at Colorado State University. Uh, about three years ago, on his own volition, he switched and he's been for the last three years the head of the ag school at CSU and has really taken giant steps to begin looking at all the places where technology not just improves uh, efficiency and, and, and economic success in our rural economies, but really where are the places where you can add technology into rural communities and increase the number of small businesses that are there to support that community. Because that was another, thing, another one of the things that we came up with on the bottom-up economic development plan is we need more nucleation, we need more small businesses uh, to, to start in the rural parts of Colorado. And that's the Jumpstart program that's through the Office of Economic Development and Trade, which basically if in, in certain rural communities, if you're connected with a community college or a state college or any of our schools, uh, there's an avenue by which you can, for the first five years, essentially pay almost no taxes to the state if you're starting a business and hiring employees in that rural community. Anyway, I say all this, uh, uh, the last part was uh, of the bottom up. Uh, I'm probably missing one because I didn't write them down. Uh, no, no, I'm on five, I think, aren't I? Uh, innovation, innovation and technology. Oh, no, you're right. No, no, that is four. And so the net, there are two more. Whew. <laughs> this job isn't as easy as you guys think. I'm just saying. <laughs> One is that we had, we had to really address uh, the workforce. And by that, I mean everything from education, 
uh, through, uh, you know, workforce training throughout people's lives to make sure as automation or, or, or technology in some way eliminates professions, how are we able to get people trained rapidly at scale for the new professions, the new careers that are already bubbling up in different places? Uh, and I think we've made a lot of, I'll talk about that in a second, we've made a lot of pro progress on that. But we have, I think, dramatically improved the way that we are, are training workforce all the way from, we have now the number of, of high schools uh, that, that actually provide coding uh, to the undergraduates uh, is up, I, I can't remember, it's up 10 times or 11 times. The number of universities, uh, the number of students who are doing some form of engineering and, and looking at uh, technology applications at all of our universities is up, again, 10, 11, 12, 11 times. Uh, real progress in terms of beginning to make that transition into whether we like it or not is what's going to be a new economy. So that workforce training, uh, and we'll, I'll get back, I want to talk a little bit about the apprenticeship stuff we're working on. I know s a, 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 at least a number of you in this room have been part of that, and we're going to begin expanding that larger next year. Uh, I'll come back to that. Uh, the f the, the uh, last thing that we came up with, the sixth thing, was that, this, that, that people wanted the state uh, and again, this was in almost every corner of the state when we did the bottom-up economic development uh, uh, effort. Everyone wanted the state not just to be seen as a tourist destination, but to see, be seen as a pro-business uh, state, which really hadn't been our brand before. And so we put a lot of time and effort into talking about how, and again, we're always going to be connected with, with clean air, clean water. Uh, we, t we put a lot of time into saying, using that, the, what makes the state so attractive, and then pitching it as a place that's pro-business. The highest standards, the highest ethical standards for our businesses, the highest environmental standards, but we were going to be the most pro-business state in America. And we have research that looks at how well that stuff seeds in, in other cities and other states among business leaders, people that make decisions on where to open their new office, or young entrepreneurs deciding where they might want to have a business. Uh, we see that, uh, that that branding has definitely had a significant effect. And you need to only look at the types of stories that are written about Colorado now in the, in the, me the business media, but even in the general media. We are recognized as, as one of the top states, one of the top two or three states to start a business. We have, in terms of job growth, one of the top two or three states. In terms of our, uh, you know, our GDP growth on a per capita basis, we are one of the top two or three states. So we've done that. Right? And as I said, we haven't, haven't gotten that, that equity and had that ec the, the strength of the economy in all parts of the state, but we're making progress in that. Let me rest on our laurels there for a moment, just say, just because you get there, and it is not easy to get where the state of Colorado is now, it is not easy to stay here. And so I'm done in a year, but as this election for the next governor goes on, I hope there is a constant drumbeat that momentum like this is very, very hard to get. Sometimes you take it for granted. You decide, well, we don't need any more people. There are certain places that don't want any more people, but there are lots of places in the state which would love to have more entrepreneurs, more businesses, more people. And I think that as a state, we want to make sure that we don't slip back in our, in our willingness to keep you know, job creation uh, and, and being pro-business at, at the top of our list. Uh, there are other problems that come with that success, and I think they're almost unavoidable. Uh, and I, you know, I'm not saying that they're easy solutions for these, these challenges that come with economic, uh, with a robust economy. But I will tell you that it's better to have these problems than a, an economy that's not growing. And there are an awful lot of places in this country right now that are struggling to get the kind of momentum that we almost take for granted now. Uh, and when you're, when you're growing, right, you've, you've got people moving in at, at large numbers. And again, for a state that's 5.6 million people, to have 100,000 people or 110,000 people move into your state in one year, you know, that's, that's I mean, that's a lot to digest. Uh, it creates, when you're, when you're building that much new housing, and, and, you know, if you look at it, uh, the population growth per year for the last five years, six years, I think, uh, is about five times 
the, um, the, num the amount of new housing that's been created per year in the last five years. And this is not unusual in a, in a state that's growing rapidly. That growth, it's hard for the construction industry to keep up. When you're not building enough housing to keep up, that means that the older housing, the housing that's 30 years old or 50 years old, what historically has always been the core of, of what we think of as affordable housing, where you know, people that are, are at the beginning of their careers or aren't making as much money in their careers, where they can live and, and raise a family, that housing gets sucked up by you know, people that are working their way up the ladder, and invariably you end up with people being displaced. And I'm not sure, when you look at all the places where we have more homelessness, uh, where we have all the challenges faced with you know, rapidly increasing home prices, right? And, it, and this is, I think, one of the more serious issues we're going to face, and we are facing it right now. You guys are all at the front lines in this, and it's, and it's not just in the urban areas. There are a number of, of rural parts of the state, not all, but some rural parts of the state that also have these challenges. We've got to figure out how we're going to incentivize and motivate the housing industry to build more affordable housing for, the, for the, that part of the workforce that isn't making you know, $100,000 a year or $200,000 a year. Uh, there are ways to do it. I think the, the, what we're looking at now is trying to find sources of revenue to, again, not to, to pay for it all, but to provide the private market an incentive to create housing that is more affordable. Uh, this last budget year, we got $16 million uh, uh, from the marijuana money, which was more than we thought we had or thought we would have, uh, to provide housing for the chronically homeless, which are always the most expensive to our communities. And again, this isn't just in urban areas. This is across the state that chronically homeless people that oftentimes have mental health issues, uh, have gone through a traumatic issue in their lives, uh, they end up needing more support. And you not only get them into housing, but you have to make sure they get job training. Most of them, once if you can get, you can find a job for them and get them into a 40-hour work week, they build up the relationships and they begin to be able to take care of themselves. Uh, and that is, again, that's, I think, the right role of, of this type of housing program for the, really for the last and the least, the people that have the greatest challenges. Uh, we got legislation last year uh, to passed uh, to rectify construction defects, which was a big problem in some of the metro areas where uh, home builders were incentivized not to do the smaller, uh, you know, the condominium projects because they thought they could be too easily sued. Uh, and we also have looked at how to, f how to figure out on a, on a uh, statewide basis to look at putting more economic development into the housing uh, in the rural parts of the state that are growing. Because uh, oftentimes they don't qualify for some of the national and federal programs that, that uh, provide additional funding for, for housing. Uh, let me take a minute also talking about, before I come back to the workforce stuff, um, talking about some of the stuff we've also done, and I've touched on some of it, like the Jumpstart program, uh, but we've really pushed to get broadband into every single town in this state. Uh, that sounds easy to say. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's not even clear exactly what the cheapest, best way to do is. There are several competing solutions, but uh, uh, we hired a guy named Tony Neal Graves who was he's worked for, he worked for Intel for 25 years. The last seven years he was the head of their Internet of Things, and he is our broadband czar, and I think we now have a much better handle on exactly what we need to do. Uh, we're going to introduce legislation this session that will hopefully take some of the high cost fund and switch that into making sure we have in the next two or three years enough money to get broadband to every single uh, part of the state. Uh, it's a little bit challenging because the federal government is also t creating a priority around this, and if if history is any lesson for the future, <clears throat> just when we go out and spend our, mo our own money building this end, all of a sudden the federal government will come up with a program and they're not going to back pay us for what we've already invested in. And yet, as you all know, there's no guarantee what the federal government's going to do these days. That's, that's both a good thing and a bad thing. Um, anyway, uh, we got $9 million in, into broadband last year, uh, which is just a start. The legislation we're going to introduce will hopefully be able to get us more in the range of $40 million or $50 million a year for the several years to get this kind of infrastructure in place. Uh, we look at, uh, last year we also addressed the, uh, the gray market. This is basically the black market of the marijuana industry. 
Uh, and I know this is a big issue that you guys have. We got one bill passed last year. We're going to look at another bill this year. Uh, we added about $10 million of funding to our uh, uh, police, local police and sheriffs, to give them some more resources to address this issue. Uh, also, parallel to that was the, the uh, At-Risk Adult Protection Act uh, to make sure that we're not, as we age and we have this, uh, you know, stronger economy, that we don't have our senior citizens at risk from fraud and, and scams. Uh, so anyway, let me then get back to the, uh, the workforce training part. What we see more and more is that the workforce of tomorrow has got to be nimble. And so we've got a, a several different approaches we're doing. One is we are, again, trying to put more technology in the schools, uh, more funding for rural teachers. Uh, if you look at it, I mean, some of our rural, sc rural schools pay their teachers so little that they, we actually have a couple, two different stories of people, of, of teachers, of schools losing their teachers to Walmart. And I don't have anything against Walmart. <clears throat> but I think it's a, it's a you know, uh, to go work at Walmart full time because your school doesn't pay you enough is, is not where we want to be. Uh, so we took, if, uh, assuming the marijuana say, sales stay high, we took another um, $10, million, $10 million of marijuana money and are going to dedicate that as an <clears throat> incentive to try and lure educators to rural districts um, and make sure that, that, we're, that they can compete successfully and get, get, uh, begin to uh, fight back from the teacher disadvantage that they've been at for the last couple of years. Uh, one opportunity we also are in the middle of, we started a pilot two years ago on what we call experiential learning, letting kids learn at work. Uh, and so this apprenticeship system, is, which we're starting now, um, uh, it is a, um, a really a new thing for the United States. It's modeled on the Swiss system, but the idea is, and I think I mentioned it last year when I talked to you, but I'll just briefly go over it again. Kids have a choice when they're going to their junior year or their senior year, and they will be able to go to work. Instead of going to high school for their junior year, they can go get a job in a bank, insurance company, uh, working at any business, aerospace, uh, could be a small tech company, could be an accounting firm, it's big city, small town, doesn't matter. But the goal would be that they would work three days, get paid 10 or 12 bucks an hour, and then the two days they would go either to a community college or a workforce training center, but they would learn <clears throat> in those two days of classes, they would learn enough so that when they're finished their apprenticeship, they would get their, their high school degree, not a GED, but get a, a high school degree from their high school. The high school will still be connected with that education process. But they also, a big part of their curriculum will be designed by the industry in which they're working. So if they're working in an insurance company, they'll be studying things on those two days of class that will make them more successful in their insurance company. If they're working in a bank, they'll learn stuff that that they will be, will help them succeed in the bank. And if you look at, I mean, here's the fact, right? 70% of the kids in this country are not going to get a four-year degree. That was true 30 years ago, and plus or minus 1%, it's true today. And I think that is a real, we've spent the last 30 years saying every, everybody should go to college, when for many, many kids, they don't want to go to college, and they spend those last two years of high school often bored to tears. They're, they're being taught stuff that they're not interested in, and they don't think is any practical use in their future. Well, now we're going to give them a chance to, A, have a job three days a week. Most of these kids, we had, uh, I think, 40 last year. We've got 250 this year as pilots. But most of them are still living at home, so they're actually saving money. And they're getting, at the end of their apprenticeship, not only will they have their college degree, but they'll have about 60 credit hours. Uh, from their local community college, which is, which is applicable. You can apply it to if they decide they want to go to one of the four-year schools in the state. We now have all of our community college credits are transferable to, to, to the, our four-year schools. I think at scale, this has a real potential to allow kids to, to have a much more successful, you know, when they're 16, 17, 18, uh, in those years before they finish high school, and, and not get kind of turned off to, to, to work and, and what, they, what they see of it from a distance. Uh, we also are tying this with something we call skillful. Uh, and, and, and that apprenticeship thing we're calling career-wise. I've got to make sure I, I always forget the jargon. Um, 
On top of that, we're, we're partnered with LinkedIn, and now Microsoft has purchased LinkedIn. And they are even more excited about this, but they, they announced their foundation announced they're going to give us a $25.2 million grant to continue the skillful work. And skillful is all about allowing, it's tied into LinkedIn, so kids will be able to have their own profile, and they'll keep a record, not of the degrees they get, but of the skills they learn, right? So a kid, as they go through life, and they get, whether they learn, a, they learn how to do inventory at Walmart, or they learn customer service at Starbucks, but every skill they learn, there'll be a way to measure their competency, and this will be in their profile that, that will follow them on LinkedIn as long as they want it to follow them, and allow prospective employers to see, oh, no, that's what those skills are, and, and this is where that person l learned them. It, it, it creates a, it, it, it takes away some of the distance between uh, potential employers and potential employees. More importantly, if you imagine down the road, 10 years or 15 years into a kid's career, they've accumulated a number of skills at the places where they've worked, and suddenly their, prof their profession disappears. For whatever reason, no fault of their own, they're going to be out, their profession, automation is taking, care, taking away their profession. It will allow them to say, all right, here are the skills I have. I've kept track of them through my life. And now I can, I can ask skillful.com, what are the other professions where these skills might be useful? And, and which of these other professions might be attractive to me? And if it's attractive, then I can, Skillful will be able to deliver a list of what skills that person is missing if they want to switch into that new profession. Here are the skills you'd need to get, and here's where you can get them. And I think at scale, this gives us great potential. One, one way to think about this is in terms of uh, bank tellers. Uh, and I know down here, all through the state, we're beginning to see more and more banks that are going to automated tellers, right? Robots, in essence. And they can hear your voice. You tell them you want 200 bucks, uh, 250s, and 520s. And the, the, the voice decoder can recognize that, and the robot gives you exactly the money you want. It's, you know, it's, it's how many drive throughs are now beginning to work. In five years, there are probably not going to be that many tellers. All right, so what are the, what are the skills a bank teller has? Right? Well, bank tellers have to be numerate, they have to be good with numbers, they have to be, have a high sense of precision. In other words, accuracy really has to matter. They've got to have a sense of urgency. They, they can't just kind of lollygag around, they've got to get this thing done. And they've got to be collaborative. Bank tellers close out in teams and they plan out their days in teams. Basic skills. Now let's take a career that we have right now in Colorado, 9,000 job openings. And it's, a, it's the broad career of cybersecurity which, you, as you all know, is not going to go away. Colorado Springs is one of the big centers right down here in cybersecurity because of Northern Command is here. But because of Northern Command and, and Space Command being here and having so many retired military people starting cybersecurity companies, we now have over 150 cybersecurity companies between Colorado Springs and Denver. That job, the job openings, 9,000, over half, probably as much as two-thirds of those jobs don't need a college degree. Well, what are the skills they need? To go into one of those cybersecurity jobs, and these are the technician jobs that don't need a, a four-year degree, what are the skills you need? You need to be numerate. You have to be good with numbers. You need to be, have a high sense of precision, care about the accuracy. You've got to be, have a sense of urgency. Time matters. You've got to be collaborative. It's the same skills that a bank teller might have. Now, a bank teller would still have to go take a six-month or an eight-month class on coding. Not that they would want to write coding, but they'd have to understand it better. But once they did that, and there might be another skill that they've got to pick up, they'd be able to, to probably get a five or $10,000 raise and go into, back into a, a, a company and a profession where they get health care benefits, they get you know, a, a, a real job compared to trying to, to find something on the, on the edges. And I think this is obviously not all bank tellers are going to want to go into cybersecurity and become you know, technicians around, or, or, or the interface between the technicians and, and, and the, the users, the people that, that, the customers of these cybersecurity companies. But I think a lot of them will. And it's a model just to demonstrate that over time, we're going to have to figure out how to re-educate and re-employ people. Because, and this is, this is something I am now convinced of, technology, it's eliminating professions, but it's creating more jobs than it, than it eliminates. Every time we put a software program into the state, and I have screamed and yelled and fought 
Irv can tell you this, every time we put a software system in, we don't end up eliminating all these jobs. We end up having the jobs become more complicated, and those individuals can do a lot more, get more work done, and provide more services more rapidly to, to the citizens of the state, but it's creating more jobs in that process. And I think our challenge is going to be to figure out exactly how does that become, uh, how do we get to that point where people at any age, right, whether, not, I'm not talking just about the 20-year-olds, I'm talking about the 50-year-olds, the 65-year-olds like myself that still want to work five more years, uh, let them figure out exactly what, what their opportunities are and what it would take to make that transition. So, I mean, that's probably one of the biggest challenges we have where Obviously, healthcare is a big issue, and, and is a, a big issue not just in Colorado, but in the whole country. Um, I'm very, very concerned. I don't know how you guys all feel about the tax bills that are coming from the federal government, and I'm not going to get into a partisan debate about anything. But I will say, I've fought my whole life for tax simplification. I embrace the notion that we could, if we simplified our taxes, we probably could collect less taxes and, and have the government end up with more money. I think most of you, even in, at the, as county commissioners, can recognize that. But it's not what I see, at least at, at, at the, the bills that are coming out right now. And I think a bunch of those bills are going to impact, uh, well, we're already beginning to see some of the our ability to do exports, especially in terms of agricultural products, uh, some of the uh, costs of not being able to, de to deduct uh, state taxes, uh, county taxes, when, when people can't deduct those, when we can't get, uh, uh, be able to do bonding and have people deduct those kinds of interest payments, all these things are going to, are, are really a massive shift from the federal government to the local government. And I think there ought to be a, a way to simplify our taxes without having to shift all that burden to all of, all of you. And I, I'm not going to go any further than that. Uh, I do in healthcare, I think many of you have heard me say this, we continue. I think we're making progress. The last year, for the last two years, uh, almost three years, I guess now, uh, our per person cost for Medicaid patients is flat. And I'm not even saying even relative to inflation. The per person cost in the state is flat. And I think in the next 12 months, we're going to begin to see how much the state is actually paying in real dollars come down. Uh, and that's something we've been working very, very hard on. It allows us to begin to think, and I think we should, we don't want to roll back coverage. We don't want to compromise on quality. But we do have, and everyone should be demanding, and everyone on a local level, at a state level, and a national level should be trying to control costs. And I think that's the last big uh, challenge. So anyway, I'll leave the, the rest of it for uh, questions. Uh, obviously, I know everyone's always going to want to ask about I-25. Yes, we're going to fix I-25. I-70, we're going to get that done. Yeah, probably. Maybe not immediately, but uh, I think we've got some pretty good ideas. Uh, anyway, I'll, I'll let it go to questions. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, come to the microphone. You've got a microphone on the left, a microphone on the right. So, yep. Governor, I'm Steve Wadley. I'm one of the Archuleta County Commissioners. We uh, just had a, a tax sales tax increase that would help fund a detention center, and then we had the money to relieve courts, but uh, the courts have vacated our county and gone to La Plata County to hold court. They can do whatever they want. They don't answer to us. They just tell us what they want. And it, it just seems that the burden for court should be a state burden, not, not a county burden, along with the DA's office. We have to fund the district attorneys, but the public defenders are funded by the state at a very, uh, very unfair advantage. And we have these judges and state employees that are not accountable to us, that don't run for election, they run for retention, that make very high demands on us, and yet, we're, we, don't, we don't have the money to make them happy. So I just wondered if there's some solution for that. Um, you know, it's funny. We, we worked on this like five years ago, six years ago. Um, and obviously there's, there's uh, a resistance to do this uh, at, at the state capitol. But you know, even back then, and I think most of you who were around when I first came into office in, in 
January of 2011, the first thing I did was sign an executive order uh, that says that the state would not shift cost to the, to the counties or the municipalities. And I think we had one debate over one issue, but other than that, we have stayed absolutely true to that. There's nothing that we signed that says we can't shift costs away from the local community to the state. So first, in terms of, of, of making sure that you get some of that, some of that courtroom activity uh, brought back into Archuleta County, I'm happy if you'll get me a half page or one pager on that, I'm happy to use whatever bully pulpit I have to, to, to push back on that. I'm not sure how much good that'll do. But I, if, Chip, if you want to try and get a little workforce together to look at that, uh, that issue again, revisit it. I'm all for it. I, I, I don't disagree that there should be some, when the state does it, you're going to have some level of equity that, you know, big counties, little counties are all going to have that same kind of basic, I don't know whether it works out on a per capita basis or how many crimes you have, but some, I'm, you guys will figure out what the fair system is to make, w the state probably should just say, all right, here's how much money there is, and then uh, you guys through your magical means will figure out how it gets divided. Morning, Governor. Uh, Commissioner Kathleen Conti from Arapahoe County. And I'm wondering, in, in our effort to control health care costs, why is it that we are in the behavioral health side of things going back to a fee for service, which has proven to be uh, very expensive and to incentivize our health care providers to provide the most expensive care uh, rather than a per patient total funding? Uh, so explain, explain in what way we're doing that, because I'm not aware of that. In the behavioral health end of the world of healthcare. So the behavioral health that I've seen, the, 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 the big project we have right now is called the SIM program, which is uh, just the opposite of that. It is trying to bundle, make sure people who have serious depression issues, I mean, you look at the suicide rates in this, in, st in many of the western states, but, but uh, I mean, we're in Colorado and we have an unacceptable high level of suicide, especially among young people. We had a, a high school down here in Colorado Springs that had, in a 14-month period, had seven suicides, right? I mean, there's all kinds of reasons, but one clear thing is we need to make sure that when someone ha is going through real depression or has a bipolar child, some issue like that, where they get their b basic medical treat, where their, where the, their medical home is, right, where their, their doctor, their general doctor is, that that person has, you know, that can uh, make sure that when they need it, they can talk to him and he will make sure there's some... Uh, some, uh, somebody with a professional training that can deal with someone with that, uh, with that uh, depression or whatever their issue is. So at least in the SIM project, it is trying to integrate behavioral health with primary health, and the goal is, and, and I think we're going to prove this, we've got, we're now a year and a half into the implementation. We've got a large federal grant for this, but I think we're going to show that overall we're going to be able to cut costs by making sure that people have access to behavioral health when they need it, and mental health when they need it. Now, I don't know what, I don't think we're paying, again, you'd have to, maybe we can talk a, a, on the side about how it's being a, a, a fee for service as opposed to outcomes. Governor, uh, Dan Gibbs, Summit County Commissioner, thanks so much for being here. Um, you might see a, a trend coming on here on, on healthcare, I believe, looking over at my good buddy Tom over there. But um, we have a, I would say, a cost of healthcare crisis, especially in rural Colorado. The, the recent numbers for the 2008 approved plans reflected a 32% increase statewide. And then looking at the, the lack of the CRS payments, we could see additional 10% increase. And when you're looking at the San Luis Valley, the West Slope, and the Eastern Plains, those areas in particular are just getting hammered, to say the least. In, in Colorado right now, we only, we only have one carrier that's statewide. And there are three or fewer options for Coloradans in 56 of 64 counties. And there are 14 counties that only have one option for health care. 8% um, of our population um, purchase insurance on the individual market. Those are the folks, those are the small business owners that are seeing these increases that are just not sustainable. None of them are seeing 46% increased pay raises year after year. And, and, and people are making tough decisions on whether or not they can afford health insurance for them as an individual or for their family. 
uh, they're paying um, enormous amount of money for child care, and then you, on top of that, look at cost of living in certain areas around the state. So I know, I, I don't have much um, faith in what's going on at the federal level, but I have faith in you, and, and I know that there are numerous bills last year that you were supportive of, um, and CCI was supportive of, of some of those bills that, that we saw last year, but what can we do and how can we be helpful in our efforts to um, make this stable, you know, uh, help out the folks that are just really on the verge of not being successful, not making it in Colorado because these prices are going like that. Yeah, I think the, uh, and there are several things that are gonna be solutions here. Uh, we'll be able to have a waiver of what a, I, I believe, if I'm led to believe that we will eventually have an opportunity to have a waiver on uh, what, what needs to be in a healthcare plan. Uh, that's being uh, widely discussed. Uh, John Kasich, who's the governor of Ohio and a good Republican governor, um, if, if, there, if, if I can be a good Democratic governor, he's a good Republican governor. I realize when you begin using adjectives like good or bad and, and put parties beside them, you're d just doomed. You shouldn't ever do that. And I, I, I want to take back that whole comment. Jo <laughs> John Kasich is a, is a good governor. He happens to be a Republican. Uh, anyway, he and I, he and I have been working very hard to try and make sure that this is a bipartisan solution. And, and we talk. Ohio has the same rural, urban issues around health care insurance that we have here. Uh, and anyway, we're convening, uh, and I don't know what the day is, but we're going to bring uh, several governors together from both parties and begin looking at how are we going to control costs and, and look at that. Uh, I think we're going to probably start with Medicaid just because we have more control over that. But over that is this umbrella that this is a, a, a very divisive issue. And, uh, I mean, the bottom line is when you don't have the density of people, it's less efficient. You, you can't afford to have enough doctors, right? If you have one too many doctors in a sparsely populated area, then you, don't, you have too much doctor and it's, it becomes very expensive. If you have one too little doctor, then you don't have the health care. Uh, the bills we tried to get done last year, were, we tried to spread the cost of all you know, the, uh, trying to even out, provide some subsidies for those very high cost counties. As you can imagine, that's always a difficult, we couldn't get that through. Uh, and I think we'll try it again this year. Uh, I think the, the trick will probably be a compromise and it won't be as big a subsidy, it'll be more of a gradual um, evening out of the landscape. Uh, but even that'll be hard. There's, the, the people that are, have lower health care costs are very adamant that their health care costs is too, are too much as well. And they say, well, why, why should I be subsidized to help some other part of the state? And I guess I've got to, I, I mean, the answer obviously is we're like, like any state, we're only as strong as our weakest link. And we have, I think, an obligation to make sure that the entire strength, the entire state is becoming stronger. Uh, and we've got to convince people of that. But you guys all have bully pulpits in all of your states, your counties, and in those counties where you are, have, you have lower health care costs and more providers, the actual cost to the individual, the individual citizens in your community, if you're in a, in a community like one of the larger urban areas where the insurance costs are lower, the increase would be very small to really moderate some of the, the, the differential between uh, more sparsely populated, populated rural areas or, or mountain towns and, and the urban areas. So I think it's worth you guys beginning to plant those seeds if, if that's the way you feel. And, and Governor, w w CCI did vote on that particular issue and support it by 70%. A lot of the commissioners didn't, didn't necessarily feel we need to have a single geographical rain area for sure, but a lot of them thought that something had to be done. So, so this, this body did take a, a, a position. Well, I, I, exactly, and I think the key though is to figure out that position Again, 70%, I don't know what the breakdown is of, of CCI, but probably 70% of the counties would be considered rural counties, right? More or less, so that, that could be a vote of just self-interest, that's what others would say. I, I think what we have to do is show that that is not a, just a vote of self-interest, and we've got to figure out how to get some of the, of the more urban uh, county commissioners to, to support, which I, th you know, I think that, that initiative, that type of approach would make the, straight, the state stronger overall. Governor Hickenlooper, Tom Jankowski, Garfield County. I'm going to double team you a little bit on this health care issue. Um, 
In our county, we have 11 percent of our populations uh, not covered by health insurance. But if you extrapolate that into the individual market, it's well over 30 percent are not purchasing their insurance. And, and for good reasons, uh, family right now in our county is paying $2,500 a month for a bronze plan, which is a $6,000 deductible. And so if, if they have a major incident, they're $40,000 out of pocket before they before they're getting into their health insurance. And, and as a commissioner, I can't rightly say, well, go buy insurance. I, I can understand why they're paying the penalty. And um, so, so I just really want to reiterate that. And, and you may not, as you heard Commissioner Gibbs, you may not want to talk about that anymore. But it, but it, is, a, it is an issue. And uh, the Rankin-Milner uh, bill for one geographic area, we support that. Also, I really feel if insurance companies are going to do business in Colorado, they should do business in all the geographic areas so there's some competition, not just uh, the metro areas. Although when you tell them that, when you say that, well, we should have, if you're going to do business, you should be in the entire state, their solution to that will be just to price themselves out of all those other markets. In other words, they'll still price themselves. They, they won't have one price system for the whole for the whole state, because they can't, they don't have, they don't have the ability to offer health insurance to somebody in a, in a, in a more remote part of the state, because they don't have any relationship with hospitals. And, and I understand that, but we're, we're being basically told by insurance companies what, what and, and I understand they have a business model. Um, and, and the other, th the other thing on that is that uh, I, I just would, um, I, I guess, I've lost my train of thought, so I, ha I had a right. other thing, but I, I lost lose my, my train of thought. I lose my train of thought on healthcare <laughs> all the time. No, I hear you. So. I'm, I'm on it, and and I, you know, there is a solution here that we probably haven't thought of yet, and if 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 there's any group that's going to come up with a solution to this, again, 70, if it's 70 percent is the number of 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 county commissioners that are in some way disadvantaged over the what what healthcare costs for their residents. It's highly likely that you'll be the ones that can think of what the right compromise is and get the rest of the state to say, all right, here's, and again, it's not going to make it perfectly equal, but maybe it's going to, you know, cut the difference in half. I mean, maybe that's the compromise to kind of get us on a road where it becomes, uh, you know, uh, significantly more affordable for your citizens. And my train of thought was that I, I personally feel like Medicaid's on the backs of the middle class in, in this case in our county. So, Got it. Yeah. Good morning, Governor. Barbara Kirkmeyer, Weld County Commissioner. And I don't have a question, I have a request. And I'm going to start off, first of all, by saying thank you for remembering about Real Colorado and the executive order that you signed in your first days of office there. Um, and, and not, you know, the executive order was about not shifting costs to counties, because my request is in relationship to that. So in the last five years, I'm going to give you a little bit of background here. In the last five years, Colorado counties have done a tremendous job in reducing congregate care in our child welfare program. In fact, we've seen at least a 30% decrease statewide in our annual days paid. In fact, in my county, we've seen a 60% 60, 60 reduction. So we've gone from paying for 40,000 days of congregate care annually down to 16,000. Yet even with this success, just in the last week, your executive director of the Department of Human Services, Reggie Bika, sent a letter out to counties saying that he wishes to, that he is going to the legislature to change our match on congregate care from 80-20 to 70-30. He did this without any discussion with Colorado counties, with county commissioners. We are the implementing partner, and he didn't even bother to come talk to us about it. It was out of the blue, and he's down today talking to the Joint Budget Committee about this proposal. We are extremely disappointed in that he failed to recognize that there are other entities that have a role in, in placements. In fact, about 30% of the placements are recommended by county commissioners or by counties, not county commissioners, but our county departments of human services. The other 70% come from other entities. Judicial has a huge role in this. And today at the Joint Budget Committee, this is what your executive director had to say about counties. That he believes in local control, but if a county's local decision is to choose to drive up congregate care use, then they should pay more. As I just stated, we're not the ones who are controlling and driving up the use of congregate care. 
And as he stated in his letter, we are not the ones who are overutilizing congregate care. And by the way, the State Department has a role in overseeing and they look at all of our placements for appropriateness. So it's not just us in this game. So my request to you is this. On behalf of the Child Welfare Allocation Committee, which I serve on, and on behalf of Colorado counties, we ask that you ask your executive director to put the brakes on his request and actually come sit down and talk with Colorado counties, bring judicial to the table, bring HICPUF to the table, because behavioral services are at issue here as well, and that we have a discussion about how we address the issue of congregate care with everybody at the table and we all start looking for positive outcomes for children without penalizing counties. That would be my request. And, and if all of your requests are going to be that easy, then I'm, <laughs> this is going to be a good day because I'm happy to say yes. No, no question. I, I assume, not knowing the details of this, that his that. Re reducing the match was an effort to incentivize. No, uh, he's increasing our match. So he's increasing. Your, he's re reducing the state's match. Yes. Right. So he's he's trying to again provide. I, I'm, again, I don't shoot the messenger. I'm just <laughs> I'm just trying to imagine what why he might have done that, and it might have been to try and provide even more incentives to have more people out of the more expensive, less successful congregate care, and get you know. Uh, again, the broader dissemination into the county. But I will absolutely make sure he comes and, visit and meets with the counties. No problem. Easily. Well, it's it not just meeting with counties, though, because he should, you know, quite frankly, he should already realize that he should have been meeting with counties. Uh, again, so let, I, I, got, I, heard, I heard it, Barbara. I heard it. Okay. I, I, I've heard it once. Great. I got it. I, I, I said yes. Okay. Uh, well, uh, welcome, Governor. Uh, Lojinos Gonzalez, El Paso County here. Uh, so in my district to the south and to the east, uh, uh, after roads, uh, what I receive the most calls on are the illicit marijuana uh, uh, issues that we have associated with that. So uh, statewide, uh, uh, accident, car accident numbers related to marijuana are up. Emergency room visits related to uh, uh, marijuana use are up. Homelessness is up. Arrests of Hispanic youth related to marijuana is up over 20%. Uh, black youth related to uh, marijuana use arrest up over 40%, I believe. Uh, so, so what are those last two? But the well, uh, arrests associated to youth uh, related to uh, marijuana crimes. So arresting kids uh, under 18, I guess? Yes. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Uh, are, are up significantly. So in the minority com communities. Uh, our youth have the highest marijuana use rate, I believe, in the United States. Uh, and, and I think the state has minimized a lot of these issues because, honestly, because of it brings in tax revenue. Uh, and so uh, uh, my question is, uh, do you believe that a lot of these negative trends are directly related to the legalization of recreational marijuana or not? And then two, in your last year, uh, what, are, what are you going to do to help uh, reverse these trends? Okay, so... Uh, do you believe that a lot of these issues are directly related to the legalization some of are, some recreational? Aren't. Some are, some are. Uh, we never used to test, and it's a big issue right now, we never used to test in, in traffic fatalities where someone died and it, was, it, it appeared there was driver error, but the driver couldn't, we didn't have a witness. For years and years, for most of history, we, we test them for alcohol, which is very inexpensive, and not for, for marijuana. Now we are starting to test them for marijuana. Right on a regular basis, not everywhere, but in many of the of the larger counties. So suddenly we do see uh, a, a, a significant increase in the number of driving fatalities uh, uh, connected to marijuana. We're not convinced. I'm not convinced that that is as large as it appears, just because we're we don't have a, a good baseline. Now to say that there aren't any, because we've also we're we're doing polls every year, and to say that there aren't any traffic accidents or or, or fatalities connected with marijuana use. That's nonsense. Obviously, I'm sure there are. But driving while distracted, people using their, their cell phones and texting, especially young people, we are pretty sure that that is a much more significant cause. Right? We see that increase in states where they don't have any kind of legalized marijuana at all. Same jump in traffic fatalities. Uh, and it's, it's almost universal. Uh, I, I think there are a couple of states where, where they haven't seen that. 
In terms of the state glossing over any of the challenges with marijuana, because we get tax money, that's nonsense. And I have, we have been absolutely rigorous to the, to the best of our capability to keep the marijuana money and using it for the unintended consequences of, of, of drug use. And so we have a, a, the, the Constitution, the original initiative, pledged a certain amount of money towards education. And so we tried to keep that proportion roughly the same. But outside of that, we're providing more resources for marketing how dangerous marijuana is to young people. We're providing more money to try to cut back on illegal grows. And you guys have probably the, one of the highest, the, all of Southern Colorado has a very high concentration of illegal grows. I got it, and we're aware of that. And I, tr trust me, I'm talking to our neighboring governors and trying to figure out how can we, as a group, work to, to tamp them out. I mean, 10, I realize $10 million isn't a huge amount of money to, to, to add into uh, that issue, but there'll be more next year as well. I think that as mar marijuana money goes up, until we get our arms around that, that's going to be a high priority. I, I, for the first time in the last two years, we're beginning to, almost every state that has very strong economies has huge homelessness and a lot of, of, of vagrants in their downtowns. It doesn't matter whether they have legalized marijuana or whether they don't have legalized marijuana. Go down to Houston, Texas, right? And, and you'll see the same issues. That being said, we are beginning now to measure and look at how many of those vagrants are from out of state. Uh, and we have certain parts of the state have longer histories of, 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 of asking these kinds of questions. And it does appear, we're seeing now, someone told me that, uh, this weekend that uh, uh, Larimer County and some of the Fort Collins area are beginning to see where they can actually demonstrate that they're seeing a higher percentage of people from out of state who are, who are vagrants, right? And that could be, I think it's, it's, it's probable that that's a result of, of us being legalized marijuana. We had an unfortunate situation in that we were the first. We didn't plan it that way. I don't think anybody when they voted for it thought that that was going to be a problem, but this could be a consequence of that, and I'm not sure how we address that. Uh, I try to make sure that the other states that uh, uh, legalized it right after we did, I just always talk about them and let, <laughs> let them get all the glory wherever possible. Uh, but, but that part of it, I'm not sure what we can do. Again, you all know this with your citizens. It's still, if we were to put it on a ballot today, it would pass again, right? By, and, and probably by a larger margin than the first time. So we're not taking that money and using it to fill potholes. We're not taking that money and putting it into... Uh, human services outside of uh, dealing with people who have drug addiction problems. We use a small amount of it for that. Uh, we're trying to keep that money focused really on direct consequences of people's drug use in the sense that that is all connected. And that's, again, in, in the, our budget is rough justice. Our, the state budget is about $30 billion. And we had not quite $200 million of marijuana tax money, of which a, a huge chunk of it is just the regulatory framework of trying to be able to check and measure everything. Uh, and then the marketing to try and make sure we do, we spend $10 million a year just on advertising how dangerous this is for kids. And just to remind you all, and I'll, and I'll get off my platform here, every brain scientist I've talked to says that, w I mean, one of the real negatives of, of, and this started with medical marijuana, so it's, it predates our legalizing recreational marijuana, but they have been so successful at making improved, strengthened, strains of, of, of marijuana plants that have higher concentrations of THC, that the THC is, they tell me now, eight times what it was in, in 1980, right? Eight times what it was in 1980. The brain scientists I talk to say without question they are all but certain, right? A remarkable high probability that a, a, when your brain is growing rapidly, so up until the age of 23 or 24, when your brain's growing rapidly, every time you use this high THC marijuana, your synapses, the way they are growing and coming together, will be slightly interrupted. And they think, and by that I mean they are fairly certain, that that will be a sliver of your long-term memory. So a kid who's only just on weekends, 17, 16, 17, 18, but, but smoking this super strong pot on the weekends, over a period of a few years, is going to have less memory. Less memory is not only how we remember our lives when we get older and, and, and one of the treasures of being human, but less memory is, is how we work. It's how, it's how we do tasks. It, it's how we do our jobs in most cases. So every chance you get in your counties, we should all, we have all the materials. We're spending 10 million bucks. We'll share them. I would love to see 
that effort to make sure every teenager knows that, I mean, my, my son's so pissed off at me that when he's, he's 15 now, and he's in a big public high school in Denver, and when we have a sleepover, we had one last weekend, so it was me on five kids, not, not at all safe. Uh, I tell him at the beginning, I tell him at the end, that just exactly what I told you, because I want him to hear it again and again and again. You can't hear it too much, right? And, and, and kids just, you know how kids are, they, they tune it out. Anyway, I, I don't underestimate the issues of this at all, and the state is certainly not, you know, trying to, to hold on to the, the tax revenues. Uh, I think we have a, a, some serious challenges in the state, and we're happy. I mean, bring legislative ideas to the General Assembly, and we'll support them. Uh, thank you. As an educator, educator myself, before I got elected, I, I do think the response is still lacking, and the Good to Know program is inadequate. But thank you. Rachel. Thank you, uh, Governor Hickenlooper, Rachel Richards, Pickin County. Uh, I appreciate you really coming here today to answer all these tough questions, and, and we have tough questions uh, in multitudes around the state. One of those is transportation funding. And while we may get I-70 fixed a little more at one time, it's, it's so bad that, you know, people are losing business, and the state is losing business. No one skis on a Sunday. You've got a, a half day. You have to drive down to be at DIA. You don't stop and have a nice lunch or breakfast. You just got to get to DIA. And uh, I drive all over the state through Club 20, any number of organizations. The roads are just falling apart everywhere. And we all know that it costs more to rebuild a road than to repair it during the meantime. There are those out there saying that Colorado can afford to bond for another $3 billion or something without a new revenue source. Uh, and you've worked with the state budget so carefully over these years uh, looking for our request for additional uh, administrative support for human services or other areas where we really, uh, we've heard about the courts, we've heard about everything. Do you believe that Colorado can solve its transportation, congestion, road safety issues without any new revenues? So and I'll, I'll provide a context. One of the reasons we have been so successful in economic development and attracting entrepreneurs here is we are a low tax state, right? And we are. We're one of the, by almost every measure, one of the five, I guess there's one measure where we're ninth lowest. But in most measures, we're, you know, somewhere between the third and the fifth lowest. And that has been a huge part of what we've sold. So I am the, the, the I mean, that's been our highest priority. Keeping our taxes down is, is crucially important. I don't see. <laughs> There's one Republican in the room. I'm just kidding, just kidding, just kidding. Um, that being said, and, and we'll, we'll, we will have, they are, they've been working all, ever since we passed the uh, hospital provider fee, they've been working all summer and all, all fall looking at all right, if we're really going to have a maintenance program, and it's not going to be the best, we don't, we're, we don't aspire to have roads like Utah, right? We don't want to, uh, we're realizing that, uh, again, Utah is a much higher tax state than we are. They've raised their gas tax twice since we, last time we raised ours. I think they're 29 cents. I think we're 22 cents a gallon. They have a dedicated one-tenth of a percent sales tax just for their transportation. Uh, they, just for the record, ex ex expanded Medicaid. They've done all the other stuff that we've done, or most of the other stuff. Uh, but they're a higher tax state, right? Their income taxes, you know, we're, what, 4.62, they're 5%. Uh, I don't think we're going to get to the roads of Utah. I don't think we should. But I think when it's all said and done, we're going to need some modest increase. I don't think it's going to be as big as some of the people have been saying, but we're going to need some modest increase in terms of, of, of some revenue source to be able to bond to make sure that the quality around the state and the, you know, the, big, the big arteries, right, I-70 and I-25 being the two of the largest, but they're not the only ones. Um, I think you know, Highway 50, and there, there are a number of them that are also very, very important to this state. We're probably going to need some additional part, uh, some additional revenue. I, I do think if that's something that goes to the ballot, what I would love CCI to support would be uh, to make sure that water gets involved. I mean, water is every bit as important as transportation infrastructure. Uh, and we've got a water plan. There's still, you know, rough justice about, I don't know, over a little over a billion dollars that we don't have. I mean, a lot of it we're going to pay for in 
people's water bills. <clears throat> but there's, if you look at just the normal expenses, the normal costs we're going to charge for water bills, there's still a, at least a billion dollars that we don't have accounted for. So over a, you know, well, not, and by the, if you look at that over the whole course, it probably will end up being over 20 years, two billion, when you get through the inflation and what you pay for. So it's probably, you know, somewhere in the 50 to 100 million dollar range of new revenue that we'd have to bond for water. And it's much smaller, but I think while you're doing it, the high cost fund, which will be maintenance, but we, we should also look at broadband as a, as, as a possible way. If you're, if you're gonna do infrastructure in the state, let's see how inexpensively we can do it. Absolutely the cheapest possible. Keep the whatever the tax increase, I, again, I'm agnostic, as low as possible, because it is, it's important for the state. It's, it's, it's a big part of our selling point, but let's not starve ourselves. When you're successful in growing, if you're not willing to invest in your infrastructure, your growth will not be sustainable, and, and people will get sick. The, the very things that attracted people here are, gonna, are then going to repulse, push them away. Last question. Thank you, Governor. Peter Dawson, back of county. I'd like to publicly thank you for dispatching Mr. Swart out to the hinterlands to uh, hear concerns and identify challenges that the small landfill operators have with uh, the solid waste division of CDPHE. I think we're making some progress. As you may or may not know, CCI has uh, um, made it a priority to try to uh, work with the legislator should it become necessary to uh, try to uh, uh, encourage CDPHE, I guess, to uh, make that division a more uh, friendly, uh, customer-oriented uh, operation and to uh, help mitigate some of the extreme costs that uh, operators are going through as far as uh, engineering costs and everything. And, and I appreciate your, uh, your willingness to uh, uh, be involved and encourage you to uh, help in the future. Absolutely. Thank you. John, how many of you have, have ever got a chance to meet John Swartout? Probably. Oh my God, that's amazing. I should have taken a picture. It's got to be 60 or 70 people. Um, he's probably the best hire I've ever made. Uh, I, we were in, I think we were in Garfield County, um, and, and we had a big kind of a town hall meeting. It was like a multi-county hall meeting. And uh, a bunch of people said, well, you don't have anybody who talks our language. No one's actually, you know, understands what the what a rancher or farmer faces, and uh, I said, all right, I, I could, you know, I bet I could find money somewhere in the Department of Natural Resources or somewhere to hire someone. And then they all said, and here's who you're going to hire. You better hire this guy, John Swartout. And if you if you want to be pretty assured that a governor's not going to hire who you want, demand that they hire that person. <laughs> but in this case, I did take the time to go meet John Swartout and talk to him. And he's probably one of the best hires I've ever made. And we have, <laughs> there's several morals to the story. That is, even when, you know, always listen to the people before you make a decision. Uh, he has been so successful. And we're, so we're partnering with Matt Mead, the governor of Wyoming, uh, Governor Bullock in Montana, and Governor Herbert in Utah, uh, and Governor Sandoval in Nevada. So again, that's three Republicans, two Democrats going and working with the Trump administration around the sage grouse to say all the progress. We are the national model of not only how to get, make sure a, 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 an animal doesn't, a bird doesn't get listed as endangered, but also how to take one that was endangered and, and get them pulled off that list. Uh, and now uh, Secretary Zinke has made some noises like that might all change. So we've all kind of ba banded together and said, all right, let's not throw out the baby with the bathwater. And John Swartout ha has been amazing this. And it's the first time, you know, we hired when President Trump came in, since it was a whole new group of people, uh, we hired a lobbying firm for the first time in, in my, at least while I, I think other governors have always had lobbying firms. But we hired a lobbying firm just because we wanted to build relationships with that administration. And John Swartout has been working hand in glove with the lobbyists in Washington, making sure that we do have relationships with the Department of Interior, uh, 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 EPA. I mean, you go down all the list of those agencies that affect uh, Western states. And I think we've had, I've met with Zinke two, two and a half times. One was only for five minutes. Uh, and have had, you know, 
at, at every level in Washington, we've been able to, to talk to them. And actually, I think we're going to, in many cases, we're, we're coming out better than we thought we would in terms of resources and you know, finding uh, good solutions to problems. Not all. And again, I think the, you know, some of the issues around the tax bill are, you should be all, like, like the severance taxes are at risk in, in, in at least one of the bills, and now I hear maybe both bills as a way of saving the money. Severance taxes are, a way, are an important part in this state of, if they recapture the half of severance taxes that they give back to the states, trust me, we would all feel it as a state. But anyway, I appreciate the, the kind words. I'll pass them along. I, yeah. I, I know that our Office of Public Health and the Environment is not always the sweetest tempered. Um, <laughs> let me say one last thing, and then I'll get out of here, because I know you guys got other things to do. I think we're, sorry. Hello, Governor. I was just going to double talk off of um, Commissioner Dawson's was trash. As we, as the state keeps growing, and we, well, this last weekend, I just bought a TV on, on Black Friday. What do I do with it, uh, with the other TV? Uh, trash keeps growing and our landfills keep filling up. So I'll just come talk a little bit. Go ahead. Got it. We'll make sure you have a chance. <laughs> Point well made. Um, last thing I want to say, we're just beginning to gear up uh, on a census. So 2020 is going to be a census year. And just to remind everybody, everything the state gets is based on getting an accurate count. And this year, they're going to have a lot less money to, <clears throat> to provide PR, federal support to do the census count accurately, which they did last year. <clears throat> so we're, it's going to be a high priority on automatic returns of people making sure all of our citizens fill out the little questionnaires and return them to the federal government. And then we will try to make sure that you all get the real information of who has and who hasn't and leave it to your discretion of how do we get the, the most accurate return. But transportation dollars, I mean, it works out to uh, uh, several thousand dollars per person that the state gets from all the different federal sources. So if we're not counting people, we're leaving money that we deserve that goes, that'll end up in some other state. So getting this right is going to take a, a heroic effort, and this is going to be a low budget year for the federal government census effort. But I think if we all work together, we can make it, we, you know, we can, we can turn the tide. Uh, last comment. Good morning, Governor. John Justman, Mesa County Commissioner. I don't think we have a lot of them yet, but as the electric cars come on and we have a Tesla charging station at Mesa Mall, and you see it used a little bit more and more, but when are they going to, how, how are we going to get road tax money out of electric cars? How are we going to get, all right, th this is the last question answered. I'll be very quick. Uh, one thing, I think we're going to see more and more electric cars. And I think they're going to have to start paying taxes. And, and there's a big battle over whether that's going to be vehicle miles traveled or whether we're going to charge them when they, when they do their, go to their charging stations. Uh, we put together a consortium of Western governors. I think we have everybody now. We have uh, New Mexico, Arizona, Utah, Nevada, uh, Idaho, Wyoming, and Montana. We all are, are, have made a pledge that we're going to try and have uh, charging stations every 50 miles on our interstates. So these are, again, Republican states and Democratic states. This isn't a partisan thing. We're going to see a bunch of, I mean, by 2025, General Motors says every vehicle, every style vehicle they have, they will have an electric version. And that they are, they are, they are going to see that they believe this is going to wrap up dramatically. And we want to make sure none of our states are left out uh, as that happens. The question of how do we get the resources, how do we make sure that they pay their share of all the maintenance on the road is going to be a battle that's going to get fought out over the next year or two. But we won't let them, we won't let them get away with nothing, I guarantee it. Thank you.